Today, I'm speaking with inspirational Dana Bullen, who made headlines in 2012 as a survivor of the vicious burn attack. Dana keeps reinventing herself, is now a published author, motivational speaker, and her most recent achievement is graduating university with a master in science. Today, we talk to Dana about what's next and what the vision for her future is. Hello, darling. Hello, Barbara. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thanks for having me again. Oh, that's so beautiful. And, and, and I think we are in a beautiful venue of Uma restaurant in Pan Pacific. Isn't that beautiful? It's amazing. It looks like safari. We're going to have a Peruvian dinner after. Good by me. And I don't know any Peruvian cocktails yet, but we're going to. We'll find out. <laughs> Then, first of all, congratulations on the third degree. Yes. So, you. third degree, please remind our viewers what other degrees you're holding. I have a Bachelor in Business Management, a Bachelor in Communications Advertising, and a Bachelor's, well, no, a Master's in Science. Incredible. Yeah. Are you proud? Yes, I am. I think if I'd put my other two degrees together, it wouldn't have prepared me for how hard a full time Master's in Science is because it was a medical degree. Um, and essentially you're doing research and working like a slave at hospitals from night to night, like all day for free. You pay to work essentially and it's, it was taxing. Incredible. That was my next question, your studying experience, because you basically for the last three, four years since we had the previous interview, almost disappeared from a social scene and yeah. which was, you know, very visible. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And so that was due to, obviously, the hard studying. Yeah, so um, whenever you do a medical degree, there's a few things that come with it. You have to be professional. You're not really allowed to do social media. But because of my profile, I had to have a meeting with the heads of the university and they were really like strict on me in, in doing any social media. And that's fine. I understand I'm going into like a, a professional environment and I have to follow the rules. So that was OK. But um, I found it like all my educators and my teachers and professors were awesome and the practice, like practicums at the hospital rotations were really amazing. But because of how high my profile is here in Perth, it was really hard to go under the radar whilst trying to help patients and just be a normal person, I guess. And um, obviously the social media was the tip of the iceberg. Like I couldn't talk to patients who wanted to ask for advice and wanted to ask me how I got through stuff and like, you know, what, what it was for me. And for me, when I was a patient, they were the, some of the best things that I got from my medical professionals, like what helped them. Um, so I got reprimanded from the uni a fair bit, like I was in wow. trouble a lot. Uh, one example is um, I was doing a mental health rotation and um, like heaps of the patients that had read my book and one of them was like saying, you know, you're so inspirational, where do you get your strength? And I said, oh, thank you so much, but look, I'm a little bit busy now, I've got to go. Um, and instead of thinking I'm doing the right thing, and it, honestly, for up to me, I would have sat there and spoke to them for ages and because I, I believe that's part of what is giving good, what giving good care is. Um, but I got rep reprimanded by the uni for saying thank you and I'm busy now because I should have said, I'm here in a professional capacity as a student and not to talk about my personal life. And I'm like, do you realise we're in the mental health ward? This, these people are fragile, like I don't want to be dismissive. Um, so it was like butting heads uh, a lot, but the learning was amazing. And just the thank you from my patients, the above and beyond that I know that I went and did and the little things that only as a patient you know to remember to do for the patients mm -hmm. because you've got to remember most medical staff haven't been long-term patients at all so they don't know how hard it is and yeah so for whenever it was really really hard those are the things that made it worth it for me incredible you actually bring something to my awareness how often i heard from mum late mum who is not with us anymore whom you knew how she suffered when doctors wouldn't talk to her and that's obviously not in mental capacity or not, yeah. but a huge, huge gap, and yet they are the lows. Yeah. So your value is double to them because you're obviously the walking. Now, how do you see it managing in the future? And first of all, how do you see to use your degree, this incredible degree in your future? What's your aim? What's your dream? Um, my aim is to 
go into the field of cosmetics and disfigurement. So I'd like to specialise in, obviously, if you want to come get like fillers and Botox and all the cosmetic stuff, great, come my way. But I want to also do like specialised cannula fillings and stuff like that for people with birth defects. And mm -hmm. um, I want to do cosmetic tattooing and paramedical tattooing. So if you've got like skin pigment loss, like no areolas from breast cancer, hairline like missing from scarring, with birth defects. Obviously, I know how to work kilo scars, laser treatments. So I, I do want to do general cosmetics, but also would like to specialise in disfigurement because I know I went to so many specialists, so many surgeons, and a lot of things were. This is just, this is you know, you're a trial here, guinea pig, and I was like, yeah, go for it. Like at some stage, I couldn't get any worse than what I looked anyway. Oh my God. Um, don't try, you don't know. And at the end of the day, I always knew I was going to have scars, but at least I could be like. I never have that what if. I'm never going to think, oh, I wish I had done this, I wish I had done... I tried everything, like, even ooga booga stuff, like witchy poo, spiritual, scientific. Like, I mean, I did it all. And I'm just glad that I had specialists around me who were, you know, brave enough to help and try and figure it out. Because it's a learning curve for everybody. It's not Absolutely. something normal. But I also would like to say on the other side of, you know, having to understand a patient, being able to understand a patient because I was a patient. Absolutely. Being on the other side of it, you do really, I've always appreciated my medical staff, but they have so many tasks that they have to do and T's they have to cross and I's they have to dot. And they are so stretched and as if I didn't have enough appreciation and respect for them, um, mm -hmm. I do now even more so. So it's like, I understand it's hard for the patients because you're so vulnerable and you don't want to feel vulnerable. Yes. But at the same time, they're, they're doing their best and they're stretched. That's and you know, with everything that goes wrong any time in a hospital, there's a new policy that which means they have even more paperwork. So it's not what you just see the doctors doing or the nurses doing mm -hmm. or the physios, OTs. It's then like a pile of paperwork that it's just not of really comprehensible. Never ending. Yeah. Dana, you look beautiful. You Thank really you. radiate beautiful. So Thanks. whatever efforts were put into it, and as you say, bravery from both sides, it really pays off. Thank you. Going back to your health. Yeah. Since last four years, mm -hmm. to maintain yourself healthy, not just beautiful, healthy, what did you have to go through? Some additional challenges? Oh, well, I think after two and a half years after I got burned, I got cancer cervical cancer, which we've discussed. Um, but I had two years ago, a world first back. So I had my entire back removed. Um, I asked my doctors to keep it. I was like, can I have my back back? And they were like, no. I was like, give me my back back. That's, that's theft. And I was like, mm -hmm. no, that's not healthy. Um, but I had a, a world first back done, which was, oh, it, I had to gain. 10 kilos for the surgery. I was literally laying on my stomach for like two months. I had uh, exposed back completely open, then taken my back off and left it exposed for three weeks until this stuff like embedded itself into my body. And I essentially laid on my stomach for two months and I was thinking, oh, all the pain's gonna come from the back, but I was covered in bed sores. And like I laid at catheters in both ends. I laid on my stomach, I had to eat, talk, like just everything laying on my stomach for months. It was mentally so challenging. And I did months and months of prehab, two months in the hospital, and then months and months of rehab. So essentially getting that back was like a year out of my life. My gosh. Yeah. Dana, how did you, I mean, how did you make yourself cope with it? Uh, physically, we, we hurt, but mentally, as you say, what, 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 what tools did you use? I mean, because to think two months lying on your stomach, you don't have a stomach to start with, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, what, what mechanism did you use to cope? Honestly, I watched a lot of shows. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all I could really do, because it, yeah. it just takes your mind to another of place. Course. But um, again, I'm so surrounded in love mm. from my family and friends, so I constantly had people in my room. And again, end game, so initially, I guess at the beginning of my, my injury, I was in the media everywhere against my own will. And then it was after the trial that I was like, you know what, I'm just going to take this bull by the horns mm. and take control of it because I was getting exploited anyway. I may as well like, have control of what's, what's, what's out there. And then you know, taking my mask off in public and the transformation and everyone was like, wow, you've done so well, what have you done, what haven't you done? And then 
that's when I was getting like inundated with people from around the world asking me like, what have you done? What works? What doesn't work? You know, and people who were, and I, I get it because, and I hate using this word, but there is no other word for it than desperate. Yes. When I got injured, I remember looking for a burn like mine before and after mm. so I could have some hope. And in fact, what I ended up finding was that I had one of the worst burns I'd ever seen. Mm. I didn't even look like a human. Well, which makes you, continues making you one of the world's biggest burn recovery. Yeah. Yes? Transformations. Yeah. Transformation. Yeah. Um, and so, but that also is a reason that, mm. that gives me, we ask me, what gets my mind, mm. keeps my mind strong. From that point of taking my mask off and to now, what I'm more known for is not the I got burned, it's that the, recovery, yes. the transformation that I've made. Yes. And so because I was so desperate for hope and I didn't have any, and now I know that I'm getting it from other people, from their families, their mums, like pleading, crying, what worked, what can I do, where can I go? I felt, I almost felt as if it was like, a, I'm not a burden, I, something I pride myself on, but it is a weight that I carry to give back. And I do it because I'm so grateful for what I've had. Mm -hmm. I'm so appreciative for my life. And mm -hmm. I, I understand how hard it is to be that badly injured. So I feel like everything that I do, you know, my Instagram or my social media, it's not like, hey, look at me, I'm so sexy. It's like, hey, look at me, here's some hope. Of this course. is what I did, this is what works, this is what doesn't work. This is what's possible. And of I mean, if you look at the befores and afters on my back, Incredible. it's jaw dropping. Some people write to me like, I thought that was your back beforehand. And I'm like, no. So it's, it's that as well. And then I'm reading these and I'm thinking, it, it really validates everything that I go through. And, and then again, I always say, I am not a hateful person. I don't have any spite or anything like that, but success is my best revenge. I think your yeah. revenge is coming across pretty yeah. strong. I see so many comments, right? You saw that you're even more beautiful now than you were ever, oh. because you are really living example that beauty comes from within. Mm. Dana, because your shine and your light is, you know, you glow in the dark, huh? Darling. You had other challenges in last oh, four man. years. Yeah. I saw the media on and off, but please, please tell me about yeah, it. Yeah, so look, oh, I hate drama, but it seems like drama loves me. Um, so what's happened? Well, because of like my profile and all the media, I've had, I had a, a charity set up, a fund um, called We Heart Dana Vollen and Through Everyday Heroes. Yeah. And Australians were amazing to donate like tens and tens and tens of mm -hmm. thousands of dollars to me. Um, From the beginning, yeah? In the beginning, yeah. yeah. Um, and then uh, the director of the foundation stole all my money. Yes, so I remember trying to get it off her and she was like, oh, she was giving me all sorts of like ridiculous answers. Um, she was like, oh, the banks, the banks closed. The, I put it in, did you get it? And I'm like, okay, I'll go to the bank with you. And it was just like, Almost like junky answers. Oh. Um, so I said to her, listen, you've got to give me my money by this date. And you knew and how much it was? Yeah, it was a public knowledge because yes, everyone does it. It's every day yeah. here as you can go look at it. Mm -hmm. um, and I was like, if you don't give me my money by this date, I'm coming for you. Mm. <laughs> a week before the date, I said, if you don't give me my money, you've got one more week, I'm coming for you. Stone cold silence from me, but if I tell you I'm coming for you, I'm coming for you. So I don't play the like the quick game. I play the long game. So um, I ended up going to the like the Australian like Charities Association, whatever it's called, as a DOSEP as well. And then I went to a lawyer to get all her accounts frozen, but we couldn't actually do that. We sent her out a letter, and then the lawyer who I went to. So by this, by the way, this whole process was years because yeah. it, like everything to get somebody properly. Mm. Like, uh, this, it's so deterring mm. to people, that's why the people get away with doing this kind of yeah. thing. Um, but I wasn't going to let her get away with it because A, I still won't ever see that money, but B, if this was children who were like, this is my pocket money, this is Christmas money, oh Here's, here, I swept the floor for this money. Pensioners oh. who were like, I'm so sorry I'm poor, but mm. here's five dollars. And mm. I'm like, I felt mm. that I needed to... Well, I felt like this Responsible is yeah, for, for yeah. their money. Like for justice, is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, justice, for yeah. sure. Um, and so um, then I got, got in contact with the lawyers. It was just time, energy, effort, money. And the lawyer said, look, one of my best friends is like really high up in the police. Mm. You should talk to him. And I was like, oh, you know, like they don't really help very much. Sorry, police. 
Um, anyway, so um, he's like, no, nah, look, he's my mate, just have a conversation with him. And I did, and I discussed it with him, and he was like, look, more often than not, these people have been doing this for a while. So he's like, let me look into it, and I was like, no worries. So he did, he started looking into it, and what we actually did in the interim was like, after we sent the letter out to her, the, like, you know, cease and desist, mm. etc. pay the money back, warning letter. She started closing down all her web pages, but I had already taken, like, screenshots of every page, every link, every everything. And um, long story short, the police got her, they charged her. She lied to her teeth. She had spent my money on first class flights, like just in between Australia, $300 lunches most days, cartons of cigarettes, wow. the hairdressers and like yeah. moisturizers. And she had the shittest hair. Oh. She got ripped Sorry. off <laughs> and she stole my money to get ripped off. Sorry. Um, so shame, but um, also disgusting. Mm. And she thought that, oh, look, I'm just going to go in there, plead guilty, get a tap on the wrist and get away with it. Mm. And I said, I told you I was coming for you. Mm. So I contacted the media and on her first, like, court appearance, they were all there. So Today Tonight did a story with her. She was on the, like, front page in the paper, Sunday Times, West Australian, 7, 9 and 10 were all over her. Uh, she lost her job immediately. And not only did she get exposed for who she was, she lost her job immediately. Um, people coming forward online saying that she'd stolen from their company mm. and um, she actually got sentenced to prison, the same prison as the girl who burned wow. me. Yeah. Dana, sorry. Oh, no. uh, sorry. And there's more, there's more. All right, so give me a short version of what's more. All right. Um, I had a, what I thought was a super fan. Mm -hmm. Again, another person I'd never super met. Super fan. Super fan, yeah. Yep. Okay, so who was like contacting me on every platform. <sighs> He, it was he, she. Well, I thought it was a he, but then I was getting mimicking phone, copy, uh, phone calls, like the same as what the girl who burnt me, like, I'm gonna ruin your pretty little face, watch your back, I'm gonna kill you. And I was like, literally, this person was so obsessed, they were copycatting what the girl who had burnt me was saying to me. So I went to, enough was enough. First of all, it was defaming, but then the final straw was, they sent flowers to my mum's house with a letter to me. And I was like, do not come for my family my because that is a mistake. And I'd been to the police so many times, so many times to let them know because this was going on for years. And they were like, we can't do anything. It's online and it's phone calls. And I said to the police, when I got burnt, I did not know this lady. I didn't know her and she was calling me and she was contacting me online. And you said to me after I got burnt, multiple times, why didn't you call us and let us know? Yeah. And I said, because I didn't do anything and I didn't know her. This is the same thing. I do not know this person. I haven't done anything. She's contacted me online and she's phone calling me. This is the same thing. And they're like, nah, nah, nah. And then I walked out again, I've been to the police station so many times, walked out and I remembered, she sent flowers to my mum's oh, house. God. I walked back in and I took my top off and I said, look what happened to me last time. Somebody was calling me online, like calling me and okay. like sending me messages online. And you told me to, why didn't I call the police? This is why I didn't call the police. If you don't do something about it, I'm going to the media. And then. And then what? what and then the head of the police department came out, had a talk with me, and it went from a state case to a federal case. The person got raided um, over in Sydney. And it was like, I turned out, it turns out the fan was a girl who was crazy obsessed with me. And she was actually stalking me for five years, not two. Um, Dana, in one question, I mean, that's horrible. Yeah. And, and the fact that you got in charge this extreme way, and because if you wouldn't, it wouldn't be. Yes, you know. Yes, and that's my why biggest don't you problem. Do it? I mean, obviously, we can't prevent psychopaths. Yeah. But the, the inadequacy of social media platform, yeah. that, uh, that's where I have a huge concern. Because right. anybody can pretend to be anybody. I know, and then rumour is fact, and That's it's right. very damaging. But not just that, you know, violence against women. Please, why don't you tell, let us know? Well, guess what? I've got so many friends going through domestic violence situations, and they are telling the police. One of, one, one of them called the police after her ex-husband bashed her, and they came the next day. You are the ambassador for Kiss Violence Against My Goodbye campaign. Yeah. Thank you, from day one, when the charity campaign was launched. Dana Darling, what can be done for more prevention. Tell me, what's your idea about it? Again, it's so basic, but awareness, telling your friends, speaking out about it. Um, even just the little things, like make a diary, um, that's not really preventing, but I think speaking out to your girlfriends about anything, anything mm. that even just makes you feel uncomfortable. Even if mm -hmm. you think, oh, that's not that, yeah. let people know. Yeah. Um, and 
to forget about the stigma because women think, oh, it's my fault. But it, or, all guys, guys get domestic violence too. So whoever's getting Absolutely. domestic violence. But we're talking violence. Yes, in a, general. Yeah. Um, they have a stigma that they're doing something wrong because normally it starts off as psychological abuse and bullying. But the stigma, don't, that's nothing to do with you. Don't be ashamed. They are the, mm. the person who was like doing the violence should be ashamed of themselves. That's right. Don't be, yeah. Do you think that in, ter in terms of prevention, schools should start educating from the youngest age about danger of violence, about getting rid of guilt, about speaking out about it, and seeking help when you first start noticing something? What qualifies under coercive control, not just physical violence, manipulating? Yeah, I do think that, and I do think they do, but because of social media, like if mm. I find like, you know, when young kids try to speak out, then they're getting bullied on social media. But when I do school gigs and stuff, you mm. know, it can be very damaging to your career. It can be very damaging to your reputation. But what I've learned is it's not real. So I got, I got burnt alive and I was mm. like essentially a quadriplegic. Then I got cancer. That was real. And mm. then I read the most foul crap mm. about myself online. And I was like, you know what? Yeah. They don't know me and no one's ever come up and said anything to me. So when I educate kids, I like to let them know it ain't real. Mm. Online isn't real and if it's going to bother right. you, just cut it off, cut That's it out. That's right. Dana Darling, what can we expect in the future? Is there another book? Is there maybe a movie about the strongest woman? Uh, well, I don't know. I, whew, I don't know. Every year, you, if you tell me what, where I'm going to be the next year, I'd say no way, but um, you never know. Yes. But um, I definitely want to get into my own business, into cosmetics and disfigurement and help as many people like, as I can. How beautiful. Mm. And I can't resist. I'm going to give you the magic wand four years later again. Magic wand, one for the world and one for you. What are your two wishes today? The world. Uh, don't hate. Mm. Um, and that falls under the umbrella of like jealousy and resentment, bitterness. Mm. Let it go. Yeah. Um, and umbrella for me, well, what makes me happy is making others happy. So my friends and family and just everyone healthy, happy, love. Beautiful. Dana, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. So lovely to see you being so beautiful, oh, radiant. Thanks. And with a third degree. Yes, and yeah, to match my burns. Up. So third well, I wasn't going that bad. <laughs> thank you so much. Thanks thank for you. being here. Thanks. <laughs>